Dear uh, ministers, the mayor, your excellencies, and uh, participants, welcome to session Transatlantic Finland and European Geopolitics, which will be moderated by two elderly gentlemen. My co-fellow moderator is uh, famous uh, Finnish European bureaucrat and uh, enthusiast Mr. Reijo Kempinen, who has been, among other duties, served as uh, the uh, general director of the European Minister Council responsible for communications. And uh, my name is uh, Anders Blum, and I am uh, working in the University of Turku in the uh, Center for Parliamentary Research. And uh, this very uh, center has been in uh, the first row of developing this uh, Europe Forum together with other, uh, other institutions here in Turku. Most important after the University of Turku is, uh, is, of course, the city of Turku, the oldest city in Finland. Yes, I, 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 on my part, I can only repeat what Anders already implied. He and I have known each other since forever, and we've done all kinds of things together, most of which we don't want to talk about, or can't remember anymore, due to advanced years, as he says. But uh, this is something that we haven't done before. So forgive us, uh, be patient with us. We'll take you through this rest of the afternoon as well as we possibly can, but uh, we cannot exclude certain clumsiness from our part. I'll be joining you from uh, the sofa over there and uh, moderating the discussions as we get to them. But uh, you'll see how it do. And you can give us points afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. This seminar will focus on uh, European security in three different settings. The theme of the first set is transatlantic Finland, the second, the relations between the United States and Europe in the new geopolitical era. Thirdly, we expect to cover the prospect of peace in Ukraine. We have top level speakers available, each of whom we will, of course, introduce separately as and when, we, when they join us on the podium. But first, a few short words of introduction. Today, our speakers, our speakers will be addressing an influential and knowledgeable audience. In six short, in six short year of Europe Forum has grown from an idea in the biggest and most important event of its kind in this country. Our speakers know that their words will be listened to more attentively than ever. The speech of our Prime Minister was a good example today, this morning. The war rages on in Europe. Russia continues to bombard Ukraine. It tries to sow discord among Western allies, undermine our defenses, build new foothold in Africa. We live in a threat environment and which has, that has changed dramatically. And with these changes, many are also uh, relearning the language of defense. As with any language lesson, it will take practice and commitment, long-term commitment. Finland has now joined the North Atlantic Alliance with strong backing from the Finnish public who expect that NATO membership will give us that ironclad guarantee to common defense against all military aggression against our country. I'll pay attention to the word all. That said, ours is a nation that has had to live so long next a great 
often unpredictable bear, and too often during our history we have discovered that at times of need, help was not coming. So we look at the future with hope, but also with questions. Can we be realistically expect Russia to pay for what it has destroyed? Today we have agreed with the speakers that uh, we will call them in the discussion uh, by their first name, which makes this introduction very uh, important. Our first speaker is uh, in the session of politics of the Zeitenwende, the Baltic Sea, Europe and the Transatlantic Alliance. We have very good setting in this, in this session is our new Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mrs. Elina Valtonen. Before coming to the politics, she made uh, a great career in uh, banking and business. And she has a uh, fluent German language. She, she is excellent with, uh, with her language skills, and uh, she is representing uh, the new generation in our political life. She has been a very important uh, vote collector, co collector in the metropolitan area and a member of parliament. She is also the vice chairman of the National Coalition Party and uh, she is known with her sharp language, she can define her speech very clearly. Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mrs. Elina Valtonen, please join us. Thank you, Anders. Um, I try to live up to these expectations. Thanks for having me. Um, dear Excellencies, honored friends of Europe and European affairs, Dear ladies and gentlemen, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has profoundly changed the security landscape in Europe. Russia targets not only Ukraine, but also the entire European security order. By attacking its independent democratic neighbor, Russia is blatantly breaching the UN Charter and international law. For the world, Russia's invasion has truly marked a Zeitenwende, a paradigm shift in both thoughts and action, most pronounced for us in the immediate vicinity and throughout the, the, the transatlantic community. Its effect is felt in the Indo-Pacific and in the Global South, not least due to the fact that Russia has actively started to weaponize food by exiting the Black Sea Grain Agreement. The devastating consequences are felt everywhere. The Zeitenwende marks a realization that Europe has to strategically invest into its own defense and break with unhealthy links to the Russian economy, while providing strong multi-level support to Ukraine, who is fighting for its own freedom, but also for that of the rest of us. The Zeitenwende also underscores the significance of Europe's long-term strategic competitiveness for the prevalence of our shared values in geopolitics, economy, the economy and, and tech. We Finns have for many years maintained and developed our defense capabilities and resilience. Our government priority is to support Ukraine for as long as it's needed. Ukraine's future is in the European Union and in NATO. The European Union is Finland's most important frame of refer reference and the channel of influence. Finland's priority is to strengthen the European Union's global role and deepen its security and defense dimension. Russia's war of aggression has made the roles of NATO and the EU more clear and concrete with respect to European foreign and security policy. NATO is responsible for European military defense through its command structure, collective 
defense planning, and nuclear deterrence. Finland supports deepening European defense cooperation, not as a substitute, but as a complement to NATO, including through the objectives of the strategic compass. Important areas for cooperation include the defense industry and its product development, military mobility, hybrid and cyber capabilities, and common rapid reaction forces. The implementation of the strategic compass has already progressed in a number of areas. These include establishing EU strategies for space and cybersecurity, compiling EU's hybrid toolkit, and updating the EU's plan for better mobility of troops and defence capabilities within the European Union. EU has also established new crisis management missions. Finland calls for decisive and swift action to strengthen the European defence industry and its output, as well as cooperation in defence investment. Finland's objective is to create a single market for defence material in the Union. We promote a common European policy on arms exports, exports the EU's common defence procurement and increased funding for research and development related to future defence technologies. Finland further supports the inclusion of the EU defence industry in the tax taxonomy of sustainable financing. In addition to hard military capabilities, we will need to make sure that our logistics, warehouses and supply chains meet the requirements of the current security environment. The EU has shown considerable unity in imposing massive and unprecedented sanctions against Russia and in mobilizing significant military support for Ukraine. By now, the European Union has provided over 3.6 billion euros in military equipment support to Ukraine through the European Peace Facility. It must be 3.6 trillion, though, not billion. The EU will also provide training for 30,000 Ukrainian soldiers this year. Finland has always been a strong promoter of EU-NATO cooperation and will do so increasingly in the future. Areas of cooperation include resilience and the protection of critical infrastructure, emerging and disruptive technologies, space, the security implications of climate change and foreign information manipulation and interference. The present and the future of the European security architecture build on a strong Euro-Atlantic bond. The cornerstone of the transatlantic link is NATO. A strong and united NATO is in Finland's core interest. Finland's NATO membership significantly strengthens the security of the Baltic Sea region, that of Europe and of NATO as a whole. Yet, the picture is not complete without Sweden. The planning of NATO's collective defence in the Baltic Sea region and Northern Europe is possible to the fullest only, with Sweden becoming a member too. We will make our utmost to ensure Sweden's accession to NATO as soon as possible. It is also essential for Finland that NATO further strengthens its deterrence and defence. Finland will lead by example. This year we spend 2.4% of our GDP in defence, well above the NATO floor. In due course, decisions will be made regarding Finnish contributions to peacetime operations. The Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, has traditionally played a significant role in the European security architecture, bringing together non-like-minded countries to discuss and to cooperate on security-related issues. Starting from the Helsinki Final Act, there has been a dialogue to search for understanding and building trust among the 57 participating states. OSCE's motto goes from Vancouver to Vladivostok. The organization is based on a dialogue between the, between the East and the West. This is the specific character of the organization. The OSCE is also a transatlantic security organization. 
with Russia shamelessly violating UN Charter and all OSCE's core principles, the organization that is based on consensus principle is now facing the biggest challenge in its history. The traditional architecture for European security has been severely broken. Even if the OSCE was not able to prevent the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, it may still be useful in the post conflict in the post-war solution. The European security landscape certainly looks dramatically different from what it did when Finland committed to take up the OSCE chairpersonship in 2025. As a chair, Finland aims to pursue to preserve the OSCE as a platform for discussion on security and cooperation in Europe. Finland stands ready, should there be room for dialogue and negotiation in the future. Diplomacy and dialogue is needed. Russia should end this senseless war. In addition, we should not forget the wide variety of OSCE work across the region, be it Moldova, in Western Balkans, or in Central Asia. OSCE's work for democracy, such as election moni monitoring or its work to promote human rights, are all crucial for stability. Ladies and gentlemen, international cooperation, dialogue and commitment to a rules-based European security order are key to a long-term stability and security in Europe. We'll, Finland will do everything in its power to pursue this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I would like to ask you to join us here. Uh, we are making a slight deviation in the program because uh, ministers of foreign affairs are notoriously busy people and Elena is certainly no exception. So we'll start with her with a couple of questions and discussion before we invite our next guest. Perfect. Okay, I was listening to it with fascination what you talked about the sanctions and the work that the European Union has done and Finland as a member of the European Union. Um, there's a recent article uh, published uh, by researchers in the German Council of Foreign Relations who argued that uh, um, extensive research shows that these sanctions are really working <coughs> in the sense that they are hurting the uh, Russian economy and uh, they have also hampered the activities uh, in military activities of the Russian army in Ukraine. However, they argue on one sense they are not working because the model is flawed and that is in energy sanctions. What's your view on that? Could there be more done? Finland is, is very open to uh, making all the existing sanctions more effective and also imposing new sanctions uh, if we can find any. Uh, which work better than, than the existing ones. Um, now, on the energy side, it has to be noted that um, actually the most effective sanctions so far in economic term, terms has actually been the G7 uh, price cap on Russian crude oil. Uh, so um, that was... Um, or the G7 were able to agree on that uh, and um, impose that through the fact that most of most of the transport logistics uh, for Russian crude is in Western hands, so, so um, that was, um, that was uh, possible to, to uh, implement. Uh, but on many fronts, uh, and now actually what we're struggling with is, is finding ways to get, get uh, Ukrainian grain out of Ukraine, despite the fact that Russia now exited the Black Sea Grain Initiative and also has uh, been has been bombarding civilian in infrastructure, including um, grain facilities and also uh, port facilities. So, so that's another thing. Um, but Finland is very open uh, and also very active in, in finding um, ways to impose more effective sanctions and also to, to prevent uh, sanctions circumvention, which is uh, actually a significant, significant issue uh, as well. You mentioned something also very important, and that is the grain exports of mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine before the war being uh, one of the largest yeah. uh, grain exporters in the world. And now uh, what happens there in Black Sea, 
has caused, uh, indirectly or directly, also famine in large parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we are entering soon the uh, mid-September when the current uh, uh, restrictions on uh, exports uh, to uh, five neighboring countries, including Poland and Hungary, are ending. Do you see some sort of a solution in sight because uh, these countries uh, seem to be somewhat non-yielding? Hmm. Well, the European Union um, has developed so-called solidarity lanes for transporting Ukrainian grain out of Ukraine. The only issue is that if you um, need to replace sea transport by uh, transport via typically trains yeah. or or, um, or, e or even rivers, it's just well slower, it's more costly, and that in itself raises the food price or the price on, on grain. And that is a significant issue, especially in the global south and especially in poorer countries where people really need the food and where food price is an issue. Obviously, the food price is, in, is an issue in Europe too. Uh, that's, that's, that's not the thing. So that's one thing. Second thing is, of course, um, we are very very much supporting the work UN is undertaking, both in trying to get Russia back in into the Black Sea Grain Initiative, where also Turkey is a, is a significant contributor, which we value. Uh, and thirdly, uh, if there's a way to uh, raise the presence of NATO in the Black Sea, uh, mm -hmm. and through that, uh, maybe not directly, but uh, indirectly secure sea transport of the grain, then um, uh, we are happy to support. Mm. One further question that I have might actually this comes from the news. Uh, I, I read it only picked up this morning, but uh, most may I have seen it before. The Nobel Foundation has decided to re-invite Russia, Belarus, but also Iran and Ukraine uh, to the ceremonies, uh, 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 and uh, that has caused some angst and anxiety in many circles. Have you heard about that and what's your reaction? Um, I, I've heard about it um, and um, I think it's a little bit strange against the background that um, we in the West now have the policy of excluding Russia um, from, from um, uh, cooperation due to the fact that um, they have broken uh, basically our belief in their um, being uh, them being a believable counterpart in international law in the UN Charter now that they are on a daily basis um, waging war against Ukraine uh, against a sovereign and independent uh, country who has the right um, to remain so and to defend itself um, I don't know what the precise reasoning is behind um, Nobel, Nobel's decision, but the only thing I can comment on and what I will say is that um, for Finland, the most important thing would be that Russia would, first of all, end the war in, in Ukraine, withdraw its troops. Uh, if there was a way to find a, <clears throat> a just and, and sustainable peace solution, for Ukraine, um, and also for us, it's very important to aid Ukraine for in the future to become members in both the European Union and NATO. We're happy to contribute to that. But for as long as that happens, we don't have uh, a political level connection with Russia. Um, but we want to maintain uh, an operational level contact because we are a border nation. And of course, diplomacy we value that, that there's at least some level of dialogue. Uh, we think that's important. Indeed. Well, finally, because uh, as I said, the minister has to run to another event, but uh, uh, you and I both have lived in London for many years, and I suppose that there's a soft spot in your heart, as is mine, for that city and that country. Are you sti still weeping over Brexit? <laughs> Actually, this is... Uh, <laughs> probably the right place to say that I would really, really hope that Britain at some point in the future uh, perhaps comes back home <laughs> <laughs> to the European Union. Uh, but for the time being, I think it's extremely important that we, um, both on a bilateral basis, Finland, UK, but also the EU towards the UK, uh, 
we do our utmost to, to deepen our already pre-existing, very close ties in everything, uh, not just the economy, not just the security, but also the exchange of people, ideas, science, everything. So very much in favor of that. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank now, you. here comes the improvisation part. Anders, can you see the minister if I introduce our next guest? <laughs> <laughs> Find my way. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Kiitos. Kiitos. Okay. Um, that went well. <laughs> Anyhow, I would like to introduce now our next speaker, uh, Tobias Linder. He is a German economist and politician uh, who has been serving as a member of Bundestag uh, uh, since uh, 2011 as a list member for Rhineland Palatina. Since December uh, 2021, uh, Tobias has been the Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here in Finland and in Turku. Dear colleagues, um, dear Mina Ave, dear Excellencies, experts and friends, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine has dramatically changed the security situation in Europe. Finland's and Sweden's historic decision to leave behind their freedom of alliance and to join NATO is a sign of confidence in the alliance as a whole and in its members. In NATO, our promise of solidarity means we stand up for the security of each one of our allies, whether in the Baltic Sea region, in Eastern Europe, in the South or in the North. Together, we share a long friendship based on trust and shared values. With Finland and Sweden, NATO gains two capable, powerful and reliable allies who will boost our defensive capabilities. Finland's and hopefully soon Sweden's accession will particularly contribute to the defense of the Baltic Sea region and the alliance northern flank. A stronger presence means greater situational awareness, more capabilities mean more options. Greater regional experience means greater security. This is good for the Alliance and the entire Euro-Atlantic area. Ladies and gentlemen, Germany, as other allies, has been actively supporting the swift accession of our 32nd ally, Sweden. We continue to urge Turkey and Hungary to ratify Sweden's accession to NATO without any further delay. Turkey's commitment ahead of the Vilnius summit has been an important step in this regard. The accession of Finland and soon Sweden to NATO and the strong common message sent at the Vilnius summit demonstrate how badly Putin miscalculated. He wanted a weak and smaller NATO, but now he is getting an even stronger, even larger and even closer alliance instead. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine marks a historical turning point, or as we say in the newest gift of the German language to the lingua franca, a Zeitenwende, in German foreign policy as in whole of Europe. As Russia is trying to shatter the European security order that has lasted for almost half a century since the Helsinki Final Act, we must defend freedom, democracy and prosperity. Germany will not waver in its solidarity for Ukraine. We will continue to provide political, financial, military and humanitarian support for Ukraine for as long as it takes. We are the biggest provider of military and humanitarian support for Ukraine in Europe. Our Zeitenwende means substantial arms deliveries to an active war zone, hitherto unthinkable for us. Just it was like for you. We continue to increase our military assistance to Ukraine and are committed to support Ukraine in the long run. We will provide 15 billion euro in total for military support for Ukraine in the years to come, including the re-procurement for Germany's armed forces. In addition, we focus on stronger air defense support like the RST system that we have provided for Ukraine and now helps to keep Ukrainian cities safe from Russian air attacks. And we focus on artillery and ammunition, which is essential in giving Ukraine the firepower it needs. 
All this is on top of our very substantial financial and humanitarian support to the country. Ladies and gentlemen, no single country can provide sufficient support for Ukraine on its own. Only through a united Europe and in close cooperation with our allies elsewhere, we can accomplish this monumental task. This is why I am so glad to see the European Union has evolved to become one of the strongest supporters of Ukraine, not only in economic, financial and political terms, but also in support to Ukraine's military defense against the Russian invasion. This is a marked change in the EU's traditional role as a foreign policy actor. We can see this in two prominent examples. First, through the European Peace Facility. Through this mechanism, the European Union has become an essential catalyst for the delivery of military equipment to Ukraine, with currently more than 5.5 billion euro devoted to leveraging European deliveries. Second, the European Union and its member states have taken the leading role in training Ukraine's armed forces. The EU's military assistance mission for Ukraine has trained around 25,000 Ukrainian soldiers by now. 24 member states and Norway as a third state contribute to the mission. Germany plays a leading role within the training mission, providing numerous training elements in Germany and one of the two coordinating headquarters close to Berlin in Strausberg. My friends, ladies and gentlemen, all this is necessary to support Ukraine winning the war. Complementarily, we welcome the ongoing efforts of the Ukrainian government to discuss elements of a just and lasting peace with other countries worldwide, as most recently at the meetings in Copenhagen and Cheddar. Let us, however, keep in mind that such a peace will only last if Ukraine has the means to ensure its security in the long run. The multilateral joint declaration of G7 and partners on security assurances and long-term support for the country after the NATO summit in Vilnius is an important step in this direction. Germany is also committed to continue and intensify its political engagement by hosting the next Ukraine recovery conference next year in Berlin. Supporting Ukraine in its recovery process is also important to ensure Ukraine's rapid accession to the European Union. We welcome Ukraine's determination and great effort in implementing necessary reform steps. And Ukraine is well aware, as we all are, of the scope of this task. A close linkage between recovery and accession is necessary in order to rebuild Ukraine fit for the European Union and not just rebuilding the status quo ante. Ukraine needs support and the continued engagement of its friends and partners. But let me now turn to what Zeitenwende means for the European Union. Our response to, Russian, to the Russian aggression against Ukraine has shown how strong we can be when we are united as Europeans. And what makes the European Union so attractive? The membership applications of Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia are proof of this, as it is the continued ambition of the countries of the Western Balkans to join the Union. However, the geopolitical challenges and the need for enlargement raise one important question. How can we make the European Union work with more than 30 member states? The membership candidates have to become fit for the European Union, but if we are honest, at the same time we have to make the European Union fit for enlargement in order to maintain the Union's values and capabilities. How do we achieve this? Firstly, we need to agree on priorities. Part of this means to ensure that the EU's budget is fit for enlargement. With more member states joining, we will have to spend resources even more efficiently, for example, by prioritizing investments into European public goods. Enlargement should be a catalyst for modernizing the EU budget. Secondly, and even more importantly, we need to reform our institutions, extending qualified majority voting in common security and foreign policy, while at the same time safeguarding the interests of smaller members, is a special importance to improve the EU's capacity to act globally. And there, is also, there are also other areas where we have to come together and think about necessary changes within the current treaty framework and, if necessary, with treaty changes. Hence, to make the EU fit for Zeitenwende and for enlargement, we need to strengthen and 
to strengthen our decision-making capacity and we need to preserve the functioning of our institutions. We owe this to our union and we owe this to the future member states like Ukraine. Russia's war of aggression has also strong repercussions in our common region. The countries around the Baltic Sea have been connected through a network of complementary and often overlapping fora for cooperation since the end of the Cold War. Most of these regional formats acted decisively in suspended cooperation with Russia, among them the Council of Baltic Sea States. And we have strengthened cooperation among the democratic partners in the region. In July, Finland took over the presidency of the Council of the Baltic Sea States from Germany. Your choice to focus on comprehensive security, crisis preparedness and resilience during your presidency reflect our region's most pressing concerns. Around the Baltic Sea, we have many common interests and often similar perspectives despite our diversity. The issue, for example, of underwater munitions showing environmental and security concerns go hand in hand. About 450,000 tons of underwater conventional and chemical munitions still lie at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. So we welcome that Finland continues the dialogue on and, uh, underwater ammunitions. The CBSS ministerial meeting in June in Wismar demonstrated the need for a former to discuss topics of regional significance among democratic states around the Baltic Sea Rim. We are glad that you want to keep the CBSS as a platform for political dialogue. So let me congratulate you on the start of your presidency on the CBSS and wish you a successful presidency year. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Sorry. Where do you want Please. to Yes, but, but. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lindner. And then uh, we will have the next speaker, who is uh, Mr. Magnus Christiansson from the Swedish uh, Defense University. He is an assistant uh, professor in the uh, Swedish Defense University's Division of Strategy, and he is specialized in transatlantic security and also strategic for the Baltic Sea region. Professor, you have now heard the speech of Mrs. Valtonen and Mr. Lindner. What thoughts arise? And uh, Sweden is in the vestibule of NATO. In Finland and in all other NATO member states, we are interested in how Sweden sees its position today. Thank Professor. you, Anders. Thank you, Anders, uh, and thank you for inviting me here. We've always had a, an excellent cooperation with the uh, uh, Åbo Academy. Uh, we send our PhD students here, but now that you've robbed me of my PhD title, maybe perhaps we, we, we will have to look into this cooperation. <laughs> now, but it, it is great to be here. Um, and um, uh, this summer, one of the most important announcements was when G7 um, uh, made a security commitment to uh, Ukraine. And I think that was important for three reasons. Uh, firstly, of course, that it is a signal to Moscow that um, uh, Ukraine now has uh, uh, security gar guarantors of the first degree, uh, and that uh, actually um, uh, sends a signal that this is what Putin is up against, uh, all the industrial might and the diplomatic influence of all the Western powers. So that was important. Of course, it was also a signal to Zelensky. He came from Vilnius very disappointed, not getting a timetable for entering into the European and, and uh, Euro-Atlantic security structures. Uh, this is a signal also to the Ukrainians that no more Normandy formats. This actually takes things to a higher level. Uh, this is a, a matter of principles and, uh, and, and high table diplomacy. Uh, and whatever uh, diplomatic negotiations that the, the Ukrainians will have with Russia in the future is actually uh, um, backed up by, by uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the entire Western world. But there's a third factor here that I believe is also very important, uh, and that is that uh, this development, of sort of getting a, a diplomatic framework for, um, or, or sort of a, a diplomatic context 
um, among the major powers for how to deal with Ukraine, is also very good for Germany. Um, because if there's one thing that we've seen uh, over the last year, um, well, first of all, the, the, the Zeitenwende is interesting in itself because it, it means a, a major shift in, in uh, German outlook coming from the Germans themselves, not being pressured uh, or pressured by international events, but sort of formulating this by themselves. However, it, over the last year, we have seen that Germany can take quite sensible decisions in foreign policy, as long as others do that as well. So in collectivizing this, and as you know, the European Union is, uh, is, is a party at, uh, at G7, this actually um, forms a stepping stone onto something else, because we shouldn't uh, uh, fool ourselves. Uh, the, and this is a bit of a comment or, or reflection on, on the, um, Elina Valtonen's uh, speech, uh, where she actually discussed the OECE. This is a stepping stone on the way to something, uh, something else in European security. This is on the way to a new security order. Um, so we shouldn't fool ourselves with this euphemism that Russia is challenging the security order. It was broken way before the 24th of February uh, last year. And depending on what you mean with broken, you can select a number of, of, of dates before uh, last year. Uh, but it is, it is a stepping stone. Um, uh, Christian Lindner actually mentioned in, in, in his uh, speech the CBSS. And this is how the European security, security governance, works like uh, a patchwork of different meeting formats. And the 24th of February meant at least three different things to this patchwork of different organizations and, and meeting form formats. There was one group um, that I, in which I would actually place the OECE together with the Council of Europe that actually was destroyed. Uh, they cannot really work properly. They were not, were not made for a situation like this. Then there is a second group of, of uh, meeting formats and, and in the security governance. I would say mainly the Arctic Council, but apparently now I hear that uh, the Nobel Prize <laughs> Committee is there as well, where there is an angst. How should we deal with Russia? Should we throw them out? Uh, no, we should not. Uh, some, some countries want to do that, some countries want to, to keep them in. Uh, Russia was actually chair of the Arctic Council up until May uh, this year. And then there is a third group of institutions and, uh, under which I would uh, put the European Union and NATO, and they are under transformation. Uh, stepping stones on the way to rediscover a role that they've had before, and finding new ways, doing things uh, completely uh, in a different way. And the, the, the um, peace mechanism is one example, and there are so many things that are happening in the system now. So, small stepping stones, There's the Swedish and Finnish memberships, stepping stones to something else, the G7 announcement providing a sort of a great power uh, uh, context, stepping stone onto something else. And we should remember that after the Second World War, when the system actually changed as well, um, this was not, we associate that with, with the names like Yalta and Potsdam, but this process actually started in 1943 in the Tehran conference. Discussions about uh, occupation zones, about where the border between Germany and Poland should be, uh, uh, and eventually uh, uh, that uh, the Soviet Union grabbed uh, Kaliningrad, etc. So the, the, my point is here that where the politicians put their feet right now is actually going to decide what new security system we will have for the future. Um, and we can also see uh, evidence of this rapture in a number of other places. Uh, out in the periphery, Austria, neutral Austria, is now joining the, the uh, European Sky Shield initiative. Switzerland. Switzerland is actually having a public inquiry looking into their relationship to NATO. Uh, and Dublin, they've had a security dialogue um, inviting NGOs, having an open discussion about uh, different options for the future. This is a, a rapture in the security system uh, and we're emerging into something new. Now, I was asked, uh, asked of the organizers to say something about Sweden. Uh, the, the Swedish, defense, uh, Swedish foreign minister, he's, he's hosting a, a delegation from, from um, the United States, the, the Congress. Uh, I'm sure he would have been here otherwise. Um, 
Now, there's a great curiosity and great interest and, and um, uh, many questions concerning NATO in Stockholm. Um, there are basically two things that, will, that, that is the immediate effect in Sweden of the Swedish uh, coming um, NATO membership. The first thing is that Sweden has to learn NATO. Sweden has, I mean, Sweden has been part of I-4, S-4, uh, K-4, ISAF, and also in Libya in the Unif uh, Operation Unified, uh, um, Unified Protector, unlike some NATO uh, members. Uh, but th this is only NATO as an actor. Sweden knows NATO as an actor, and NATO knows Sweden as a, as a valued partner. But when it comes to questions like uh, NATO as a community, those 31 different strategic agendas, uh, we have looked closely to, to some of them, but uh, apparently now, when we're discussing with Turkey, there are things that we need to learn about NATO as a community. And above all, NATO as an organization, those 154 different committees, hundreds of working groups, uh, there are many, many things that need to be learned. I, I got a telephone call uh, just the other week from a journalist from national media. He, he asked me, does NATO have uh, military staff? Uh, so th there's, a, there's a long way, th th that's an extreme example, but in, 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 uh, in many different dimensions, uh, both in the armed forces and among the Swedish public, and among e experts as well, we need to learn NATO. Finally, Sweden, of course, eventually will need to decide what we want to do with, with NATO. There's a defense cooperation agreement now negotiated with the United States. Many things will actually be decided on that. I hear now in Stockholm that November could be uh, a time for, to look out for that. Um, also, Sweden is tilting its defense bill so that when we get the capability targets for 2020 for in 2024, we will also have uh, a five-year defense bill. A lot of money is put into the system, uh, but of course we need to figure out where, where our place is and where we're going to put our national um, eggs in what basket, uh, because there are many options. So, and I think that will actually come eventually. Um, things happen very quickly quickly last year, and uh, so we need to learn NATO and eventually to decide what, what we want to do with NATO. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, and please you. join us uh, Join us to the sofa. Should I? Oh, Tobias, can I? Uh, yeah, please. Do. please. Uh, can, I, can I ask, um, start with you? I mean, um, of course, there are so many things we would be interested in hearing from you, but uh, on the other hand, when I was listening to uh, Minister Walton speak, there are some topics we can't just avoid today, Ukraine being probably the number one of them. What are your thoughts on the current situation, uh, first on the sanctions? Um, are they working or do you share the view that uh, your compatriots in the German Council of Foreign Relations have had that, in particular in oil and gas, much more could be done by, for example, introducing tariffs? So I'm totally convinced sanctions are working, what we see by even by the official numbers of the Russians on the development of their economy. And I don't believe that the official numbers are the real numbers or to reflect the real situation. We see that there's some significant influence from the sanctions on the Russian economy. And I also agree with Elena on, on the issue. It, it, it has consequences on Russia's ability to produce military systems. We, we see consequences, but we would be wrong or naive if we, if we would think of sanctions like a thing, you do sanctions today and you see the reaction tomorrow. The, the, the challenge with sanctions is always you need to be at some point a little bit patient. You need, you need to, to wait and see. And the other thing is sanctions are never complete. They are never perfect. What we are doing on the European level now in, with respect to compliance, to loopholes, to maintenance, is to see, okay, where are possible circumventions of the sanctions? Why are third countries or why are our own legislation? So, uh, you know, we have harvested all the low-hanging fruit with the first few packages. Mm -hmm. Now things are getting more complex, mm -hmm. but it does not mean that, that, that we shouldn't progress. And on, on, the, on the price cap uh, with respect to crude oil, we see effects. I can imagine that we move further, that was the first step, and that we, that we adjust the, the, the ratio or the, let's say, the bar of the price, the price cap, for sure. And we also need, last comment, we also need to reach out to third countries. Wherever we cannot expect countries 
which are not a member of the European Union. We cannot expect them to be fully aligned 100%, but at the same time, if you have countries who want to come closer to Europe, who want to have closer ties, economic cooperation, what we can expect is that if we see something in our data that they react, that they are not a safe haven, that they do not give an opportunity for strategic circumvention of sanctions, mm. there's some work need to be done. Well, at the moment on the ground, it very much looks like a military uh, stalemate for the time being. Um, but how long can this continue? And does the West have the power, the muscle and the unity to force Vladimir Putin into a kind of breaking point that he says, no more, that's it, I'm pulling out? So, you know, I'm, I'm an ordinary state minister, not a magician who is able to foresee the future. But what we see on the ground is that the Ukrainian forces are progressing slowly. That's the truth. They are progressing, but it's slowly, and they need lots of resources. But they are making progress. For us, that means we, we, have, to, we have to do everything we can do in terms of sustainment, be it ammunition, be it spare parts, be it training, be it financial support and everything that goes beyond. And I'm totally convinced that we need to, you know, we, we, we cannot uh, ha have a perspective where we think, oh, the war might end in the next six weeks, and if it doesn't, then we have to look mm. for the next six weeks. We have to look at time frames of six months of years. So when we are talking at the moment, for instance, also in my own country on, 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 on cruise missiles like the Taos, if we are talking on, on deliveries of more main battle tanks and all those things, we have to prove to Mr. Putin that we have a long and deep breath. Mm. This is a marathon, mm. not a sprint. I'm convinced we, we have the capabilities, we have the ability to sustain. Uh, when I say we will support Ukraine as long as it takes, it's not advertisement. Mm. Well, I think uh, th this last question, um, actually, I mean, the, the, the current situation is uh, the sort of the, the defining moment for the European defense industry. Um, it was um, uh, consolidated, was the word, in the, in the last 15 years. Uh, and now it needs to, to switch back into war mode. Um, there needs to be political will as, uh, as well, but we, we, cannot, we cannot operate the way we do right now. Uh, the Polish have been so disappointed with, with their uh, rearmament program. And of course, you know that they're reaching out to, to South Korea and, 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 and other actors. We need to step up this. And, and the fact that we haven't had sort of around the clock ammunition uh, uh, manufacturing since this spring is really appalling. Uh, the, the, I mean, this is a. Uh, um, a, a defining moment for the European defense industry. We need to, need to fix this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, this uh, time frame is, is very crucial. What uh, Tobias said about this uh, six months or six years, that is really the perspective because uh, the Russian, uh, Russian way of thinking time is much more longer and much more patient than ours. Yes, but we, the, the Western Europeans need to empty their, their shelves because their security is best defended on the Dnieper right now. Uh, so they can resupply and restock later. Anyone opening those storages in, in, in a few months and they still have a lot of stuff that could be used in, in, uh, in Ukraine should be ashamed. So we are short of time, but uh, to make some final conclusion, uh, we are around the question of Ukraine when we are spoke, speaking about the uh, new security order in Europe. Is it so? Ukraine for sure was, a, I believe it was a wake-up moment. It was the most dramatical way to show and to prove that for many years, for decades, especially in my own country, Europeans had been very naive on Mr. Putin. There are lots of things we as Germans could learn from Poland, from the Baltic countries, also from Finland. You have your, your own experience, and your, your expertise when it comes to Russia. But we, we should be very clear, the Russia after the war in Ukraine, Russia after Ukraine's victory, and even Russia after Putin is very likely to be not better, to be not more friendly or let's say hostile, than today, meaning that what we have to do with our own capabilities, with our own armed forces, is, is a long run. And there is, mm. there is 
no need and uh, no possibility of being being that optimistic to say, oh, let's do 2% for a few years and then things will get better. I believe the security architecture in Europe as a whole has changed for more than one decade and we have to be prepared for that and we, we have to react to that. Magnus. Well, I mean, even if we imagine some kind of best case scenario, what happens in, in, in Moscow, some speculation about regime change, uh, etc. Um, sort of a sort of a total withdrawal uh, that would still leave us with decades of internal turmoil concerning all those war criminals, all those acts, deeds that needs to be settled for, and the Russians themselves would need to come to terms with this Vergangenheitsbewältigung, uh, which goes way back in many layers in the Russian Russian case. So, in 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 and many things can go wrong in 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 that process. So, even if we think of the most optimistic scenarios, we need to prepare for the long haul. Mm. Absolutely. This long-term perspective is, is the vital question. Gentlemen, I thank you very much. Uh, let's have a good hand for, for our speakers and we are going to uh, the next session. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, now we uh, focus next to the question of United States of America, Europe and geopolitics in Northern Europe. We have a little bit different angle and uh, I am sorry to tell you that our Minister of Defense had, a, had, a, had a, uh, something else to do, he is not able to come, uh, but uh, we, have a, we have a special uh, person to, to, uh, uh, to speak on behalf, uh, to speak uh, instead of him, but uh, we will change a little bit now the order of the original idea. And uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, because I, I didn't uh, had time to speak with Mr. Hickey before then, that he is the man to start, <laughs> if that is okay. Uh, but before he does it, a uh, few words. Uh, so in this section, we focus on the relations between Finland and the United States and how this is reflected in the future development of Finland's neighboring region. It is very important for us to hear both the American view and that of our important neighbor, Estonia, uh, who is also present. This discussion is complemented uh, by an academic perspective, as well as uh, our uh, former ambassador of NATO, who, whose term in Brussels ended Yesterday, Mr. Klaus Korhonen, who is also present here. But the, first, but the next speaker will be U.S. Ambassador uh, of uh, U.S. Ambassador in, in Finland, Mr. Douglas Hickey, who is uh, actually origins from, a, from business and who has now been serving our great partner, United States, here more than a year. Uh, what are your expressions and uh, what is your perspective uh, to the European, North European geopolitics? Please, Doug, welcome. Great. Well, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here uh, in your beautiful city. Uh, Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, you know, I've been here about a year and a half in, uh, in Finland, and I have to say, when I was asked to do this, uh, I called a good friend of mine, John Kerry, and I said, this is well before the invasion took place. And I asked John, I said, what do you think about me going to Finland? And he said, all you need to know is NATO, Russia, and climate. And uh, he was spot on. And again, this was well before the invasion. 
the relationship that we have with Finland today, I would say, is the strongest it's ever been. Uh, and it continues to grow. And I don't just mean that from a perspective of a military perspective or NATO, but if you look at what we're doing bilaterally from a commercial perspective on technologies, uh, on wire, uh, wireless technologies, on green technologies, quantum computing and the like, those relationships are incredibly strong and growing. The relationships we have on educational bilateral relationships continue to grow uh, in a very aggressive way, in a very positive way. Uh, we were with some students this morning, and we were talking, they were asking me, what your experience has been like since you arrived here in Finland? And I said, you know, it's interesting because some amazingly good things have happened. Um, uh, uh, when I arrived, and some really horrific things have happened. Uh, the good things, I think, are pretty obvious. The accession to NATO of Finland on April 4th, uh, and we had a ceremony at the U.S. Embassy uh, in Helsinki where we had our local staff and our American staff together and we had it on a huge uh, TV in the atrium of the, the embassy. And we were all looking at the same time at the Finnish flag being raised in Brussels. And I will tell you, there wasn't a dry eye in the house, whether it be an American or a Finn, especially when they started playing the Finnish national anthem. I mean, it was pretty extraordinary. And that just exemplifies what's happened with the relationship about how close it has gotten. Now, the horrific thing, I think, is really obvious. The second invasion by Russia uh, into Ukraine, the fact that we sit here today and more than 500,000 casualties on both sides, most of those uh, Russian, uh, but it's a brutal, brutal war. And I saw my, my partner Olga here, the ambassador from Ukraine, just a few minutes ago. It's, it's pretty extraordinary what's happened. We, all of us, should be thanking the Ukrainians for what they're doing. Uh, because they're not only defending their own sovereign country, they're defending democracy around the world. And it's extraordinary what they're doing. We should, and I think we have to the most part, give them everything they need. And again, not just from a military perspective, but we have to give them what they need in order to, for them to prevail in Ukraine and reestablish their country and have the Russians exit. That relationship with Russia, uh, there's, I've heard people, different people talk about this. Uh, that is gonna be a relationship that's gonna take an awful long time uh, to rebuild and recover. I'm sure at some point in the future it will, but I'm not quite sure how long. I, I surmised it won't be in my lifetime, quite frankly. Um, and it's going to be, that's going to be a torturous relationship. And someone mentioned regime, regime change earlier. We have to really be careful what we ask for. Because behind Putin are some people that think Putin hasn't been aggressive enough. Uh, so we have to really be thoughtful about that whole uh, prospect as well. But our goal as we sit here today uh, and talk about this from a U.S. perspective is continue to support Ukraine in every way possible uh, and continue to do that until we resolve this conflict in a, pos a positive way, having Russia exit Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Over here, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let us uh, continue because uh, we will have better discussion with more discussion discussers. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Ambassador Sven Sakov, who is uh, quite well known about his uh, activity in uh, security political uh, discussion. He has been. Uh, working in, in various uh, Estonian uh, research centers as a director or, or 
Deputy Director uh, in, uh, under the Ministry of Defence. And he is very well informed about, about the situation here in the Northern Europe. Sven, you, have no, you are not first time in Turku, so please take the podium and... Um, thank you very much, uh, Anders. And, um, Madam Mayor, uh, colleagues, professors, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, in Turgo. I think it's probably my fifth or sixth time on an official visit here. The, um, uh, when I was listening to, um, to Doug about his um, friend John Kerry counseling him before coming to, to Finland, I did not have as wise counselors as you, uh, but I did ask around, asking so is what is going to be um, and what is the advice people could give me uh, when I come to, to Finland, uh, bearing in mind that um, before that I've been working uh, mostly with NATO issues or on NATO issues uh, since 1995. So they said two things. First is that um, Finnish politics, nothing happens. It's uh, stable, bordering being boring. Not true. Uh, second thing they told me, that don't even mention NATO, it's hopeless. Uh, also not true. Um, uh, but I'm very happy how it has turned out, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, Finland and uh, joining NATO. Uh, I met recently one Finn who said that Sven, don't worry, you can still con congratulate uh, us on joining NATO. We are never really kind of, you know, uh, had, had enough. You know, just so I did. And I can also congratulate all of you here, Finns, on joining NATO. I will um, uh, talk a bit about, of course, the war. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot talk about the peace. And I think we do not need to talk necessarily uh, without any preconditions about the peace. And uh, when we are looking at where we are right now uh, in this horrible genocidal war of aggression Russia has unleashed on its neighbor, uh, very broadly and on a very kind of a broad level, I think we have two scenarios, what we can think of. One is a Ukrainian victory, and victory in a way as Ukraine has defined it, but the Russian occupiers have been kicked out from constitutional Ukrainian territory, that the war criminals will be brought to justice, and that the crimes of aggression will be answered for, uh, uh, and that Russia will be contributing uh, big time to the reconstruction of Ukrainian economy after the war. So this is a positive scenario. I think we can all imagine how good that would be. But what if that does not happen? And actually Russia in the end will prevail. I would say that when we are in a scenario which will potentially lead to World War III. What I mean by that? That means that aggression, aggression pays off. You can do it, but in eventually you will get what you want. All those countries who have some designs somewhere in the world would take notice that this is, this is the time. International community cannot stand up. And despite everything and a bit of the sanctions, eventually you will win. Um, and when we think of a large war in the Far East and the economic and political consequences of that, then I think all the different economic crises that we have had before will pale in comparison. Plus, of course, the war itself. Uh, nuclear weapons will most probably proliferate because if there is one lesson from all the aspiring nuclear, potential nuclear powers will take from what has happened in Ukraine is that you need to have nuclear weapons in order to survive. Just imagine, in 1994, Ukraine had a third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Um, it 
gave them away uh, on a promise and on this kind of security guarantees, including from Russian Federation. Uh, and result is basically rolling in front of our eyes, unfortunately, on TV screens every evening. Of course, there is only one way how aspiring nuclear powers will look at that. And then, in, if, a, in, if a regional power, regional rival of a country X, Y, or Z has nuclear weapons, then the other one has to have it, and we will have a spiral of nuclear weapons proliferation. And then think that Russia will stop them. Uh, I think this is a lunacy. That means that uh, we haven't heard anything from 1930s, learned anything from 1930s. Aggression never stops. It will go as far as is possible uh, and will grow stronger and stronger as it is acquiring more and more resources. I think we have all studied our history books that, you know, quote unquote, if we give Germany, say Czechoslovakia, or Sudetenland, Austria, uh, can militarize Rhineland, things like that, then, you know, he will be a satisfied power and everything's going to be good. Uh, has not turned out well and will not turn out well. And that basically means that we'll be in 1930s type of spiral and this will have no good consequences for the small countries in exposed places like Estonia or Finland. And of course here, why we haven't been, why we're actually in a much better position right now and can be moderately hopeful is of course, yes, as has been pointed out, but because of the bravery of Ukrainian people, Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, probably the most consequential one sentence what has been uttered in the last two years has been Zelensky's, I need ammunition, not a right. Now, people say that, well, uh, Russia should not really be defeated because the consequences of a defeated Russia are unknown. Um, or that nuclear powers cannot lose a war, which is, by the way, just false. Nuclear powers lose wars regularly. Um, now, we just imagine that a positive scenario, as I said, that Ukraine militarily kicks out Russia from its territory. It has to be a decisive victory so that every babushka in every Siberian village knows that Russia was beaten like a drum on the battlefield. In that case, we will have actually hope for the future of Russia and for the future of European security. Uh, let's look at this history. The di different times when Russia lost a war. What happened? Russia lost a war in, in Crimea in 1856. Uh, that resulted with a liberal reforms of Alexander II and life in Russian Empire got better. Russia lost the war to Japan in 1905. That resulted with a 1905 revolution and liberal reforms. Life became better for the people in the Russian Empire. Russia lost the First World War. Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland became independent. Life became better for people in those countries. Russia lost war in Afghanistan in, in 1989. Half of Europe was liberated, including my country. Life became better. So let's look at historical evidence if Russia wins a war, Second World War. Half of Europe was enslaved, including my country. And for those people who say that we need to have peace at any, 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 any case, let's then just keep Crimea or Donbass and so forth. Um, I have a one thing of, uh, uh, what I want to remind them of. But, uh, travel to Tallinn and in uh, the seaside, in, in, in the eastern side of Tallinn, there is a memorial for the victims of communism. Very somber, very nice, black granite rock. 
And there are names of 23,000 people. Those are the victims of communism whose death, circumstances, time, and place are known. There are many, many thousands whose place of death in Siberia was not known. Those people were all killed by the Russian peace, Ruskimir, which also means Russian world, during the peacetime. The biggest deportation took place in 1949. So those people who call for that kind of things, you know, land swap for peace, they actually condemned millions of Ukrainians to that type of fate. And I don't think we have a, we can morally do that. Now, in order for Ukraine to prevail on the battlefield, what we need? Of course, political support, economic support, military support. I have just, you know, we, we, we do not have too much time, so I will just talk a bit about the military support. Estonia has given Ukraine uh, military assistance uh, in the tune of 1.3% of its GDP. Um, we are number one in the world in that respect. The, our problem is not this 1.3%, the problem is 100%. Estonia is a small country, not too affluent, so even if we give 100%, this is not enough. If you take together the whole of the Rammstein group countries, basically those countries who have been given military support regularly and have a regular meetings, uh, and when you look at the GDP, combined GDP of the Rammstein group, then this is 47 trillion euros. And if you take just 1% of that, you'll get to 470 billion euros. Instead, actually, the average uh, military support of Rammstein Group countries is 0.2% of the GDP. So I think uh, there's a lot of room of improvement. Uh, so uh, kind of, you know, military support has been, in my calculations, around 100 billion, but should be at least five times bigger. Uh, and then I think uh, we, will, we will get somewhere. Now, why it hasn't been? I think there are two reasons. One, during the last one and a half years, we have heard a lot about the fear of escalation, but this thing is going to be escalatory, this will be escalatory. And another is just that we do not have stocks. That in the last 30 years, European security defense system has atrophied considerably. So that basically we do not have deep pockets where to bring out ammunition and artillery, and so forth. The, um, and fear of escalation is, of course, um, has been nonsense. First, by definition, es uh, escalation at the battlefield means that one party to the conflict will bring to the conflict a weapon or a method of warfare which has not been there before. Has Russia used tanks? from the first hour of, a, of this war? Yes. Have they used aircraft? Yes. Have they used long-range missiles? Yes. How can Ukraine using the same kind of thing be escalatory? It's nonsense. You remember, two years ago, the discussion was that maybe we can send helmets in Europe. Uh, but uh, ammunition or lethal aid would be escalatory. Now imagine that if, before the war, Europe would have sent even, I don't know, a quarter of a military assistance to Ukraine, what we have been sending now. Would there have been a war? Or maybe we would have showed the determination and strength. And this is the only thing that Putin actually values, strength of the opponent. And then he will back down. The, um, Estonia sent, luckily, uh, javelin, American-built javelins uh, before the war started. They were used in the defense of Kiev. We sent them uh, in a very large quantity. I cannot tell you the number. Very large quantity. And of course, we have had also internal criticism. Uh, but I would say the, the, the crux of the matter is that 
Why does Estonian army have javelins, for example? We are not to fight Latvians. Uh, Estonian army has javelins, so that if necessary, they will destroy Russian tanks. Put it very simply. What are we doing right now in Ukraine? They are destroying Russian tanks. Uh, they are fulfilling their life purpose. We are not giving them away. We are investing into our own uh, future and our own security. Now, people are saying, and I'm you know, wrapping up here, is that uh, we will be supporting Ukraine as long as it takes. This is very right message, but I would want to add two more short sentences. Also, as much as required, and as quickly as possible. Because uh, the quicker we give the military assistance in terms of ammunition and weapons and more to Ukraine, the quicker the war will end. Um, because all those discussions, can we send tanks, can we send the aircraft, is that escalatory? It took months and months and months. For us, it's time, measured in time. For Ukrainians, it's measured in human lives. Tens of thousands of lives lost. And this is, of course, the sad part of any conflict, especially this one. And for the future and for any perspective of a peace deal, any type of deal with Putin, that would basically be based, or has to be based, on us thinking that he can honor any deal. Ask Prigozhin uh, how long did his deal with Prigozhin, that Prigozhin's security will be taken care of last. Exactly two months. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's go forward and uh, now we ask to the podium the Finnish speaker uh, who finalized his term in uh, the headquarters of NATO as a representative of our mission in NATO, Mr. Klaus Korhonen. He has been also an ambassador representing Finland as an arms control ambassador as well as ambassador in Netherlands. And uh, Mr. Korhonen's career in, uh, in, uh, in Brussels was very, very uh, exciting in a sense that he was in the uh, focus of all uh, events of the process when Finland joined the NATO. Klaus, you're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Andres. It's a pleasure to, to, to be here. Uh, as you said, um, my uh, assignment as the permanent representative of Finland to NATO came to an end yesterday. So the uh, title on the screen is, is, is very accurate. Um, <laughs> before I, I return to my, my own experience in Brussels, I would just like to, to, to pick up on uh, what uh, my, the two previous speakers said on Ukraine, uh, because obviously this is a topic that comes up uh, in every speech. I would just like to add that, that um, I'm a strong uh, supporter of, of, of sanctions, which are now under discussion. I have always said that sanctions uh, are not a cobra, they are a boa snake. The sanctions have an effect, um, not maybe as quick as we would like, but they have an effect and, and uh, when it comes to Russian aggression against Ukraine. So uh, they, have an, uh, uh, they affect Russia's uh, calculus. But um, certainly, I mean, my, uh, my, my four years in, in, in Brussels uh, were um, unforgettable. Uh, 
I would like to pick up what Ambassador Higgy said about um, the 4th of April um, this, this year, uh, when the Finnish flag was hoisted uh, to the flagpole uh, in front uh, of uh, NATO's main entrance as the 31st uh, flag uh, in, the, in the flag ring uh, at NATO headquarters at 4, 4 p.m. So immediately when uh, the flag was up there, so um, the yellow-blue identity cards of representatives of invitee countries was taken away from us, and we, and we received the all-blue uh, ID cards of a member. And I can assure you that during that afternoon, I'd had to take this card many times and just look, have a look to, 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 to believe that uh, this, is, this, this, is, this is for real. So, so also, of course, very memorable and, and very uh, em emotional. And my comment, short comments here, uh, of course, they are from the perspective of a representative or a former representative of a country which has just recently joined uh, NATO. Um, as a member um, of um, uh, NATO, Finland continues to bear uh, main responsibility for her own defense. Finland has come to NATO first and foremost as a security provider, not as a security consumer. Um, when Finland joined, we did not set any conditions, any restrictions, any caveats for our membership. Finland assumed full obligations, but also rights of an ally. Like the European Union, NATO uh, is about peace. Finland's accession to NATO is not against anybody. But it will increase our security and decrease the likelihood of aggression and hostile pressure against Finland. And I'm convinced that Finland joining NATO will also make the alliance stronger and safer. Now, people want to know more than that. Hundreds of times I have faced the question, what is the full impact of Finland's and Sweden's accession to NATO? What are the effects to our two countries, to our neighbors, uh, and to NATO itself? Now I refer to the flag hoisting ceremony in April at NATO headquarters and, and um, it means that next Monday, now after the weekend, Finland has been a member of NATO exactly for five months. Five months. There is the famous story about Henry Kissinger's question in, in 1973 uh, in Beijing when the then Chinese Prime Minister Zhou Enlai, who is a, a great expert on history, um, uh, Kissinger asked on, on how uh, Zhou would assess the impact of the 1789 French Revolution on world history. Zhou and Lai reportedly said, it's too early to say. So, um, uh, one step at a time, I very much liked uh, Professor Christiansen's uh, comments about first learning NATO. The true meaning of our accession to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, Washington Treaty 1949, will be unfolding over time. And we will be in a privileged uh, position to witness that. Um, and steps are being taken. Um, Finland, of course, is making progress on many fronts at the same time. And on June 12th, um, NATO and Finland concluded the formal uh, process of integration of Finnish defense forces to NATO, which meant that a sufficient level of interoperability was reached according to NATO standards for a member state. The Finnish military integration process was fastest in NATO's history. We are speaking about equipment and modernization, force structure, cyber defense, and things like that. For Finland, Military alignment uh, marked a historic change, but I also want to emphasize that there, is, there was a lot of continuity. Finland had already been, for years, NATO's closest partner, together with Sweden. Russia's invasion of Ukraine brought to sharp relief the def deficits of security in Northern Europe, but it did not change the underlying geopolitical reali realities that had been there all along. 
After the Cold War, there has been growing realization that security of the Baltic Sea region and the high north are connected, and that northern Europe should be seen as a whole. And here, high north refers, in NATO jargon, to the European part of the Arctic, approximately from Greenland to the Norwegian-Russian border. That makes Finland and Sweden, and precisely Finland and Sweden together, interesting to NATO. So, the Baltic Sea, Northern Atlantic, and European uh, Arctic maritime area form a triangle, and Finland and Sweden have all the time been there, right in the middle. With Finnish and Swedish accession to NATO, this gap will be filled, and Northern Europe will be an integrated whole when it comes to security and defense. So, in mere geographic terms, this is a big area. Finland and Sweden and their territorial waters amount together to close to one million square kilometers. And as an ambassador to NATO, uh, it was my duty to take a step backwards and try to see my country in the eyes of other allies. And I think it's fair to say that we don't necessarily realize how important uh, our accession really was from NATO's point of view. Uh, expectations in the alliance uh, are high, and our task uh, as representatives of Finland to NATO has been also to keep those re expectations realistic. And I stop here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Klaus, thank you very much. And uh, now we have uh, our second academic uh, speaker, Professor Kulla who has a uh, Rinna Kulla from the University of Tampere. Your strong international experience, uh, for instance, in the United States, in the United Nations, France and Austria, as well as some other strategic countries, have made you a clear exception in the Finnish research team, because you have uh, exceptionally good network relations. This is evidenced, for example, by your recent appearances on television. How do you comment these speeches? Please, Rinna. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Excellencies and uh, dear audience. Um, I was asked to provide an academic perspective, which is a, perhaps a little bit challenging, as all the other speakers here represent strong nation states and they have state perspectives and uh, views. However, on the other hand, um, perhaps my academic perspective personally is rather suited to this panel. I have an um, um, Euro-Atlantic background in the way that I was first educated in Denmark, on the other side of the Baltic Sea, in high school. And then I went to university first in the United States in New York, then in Oxford, then I went back to the United States in Washington, D.C., where I became a doctor, and my first job was also in New York in universities. Um, Estonia, I only studied in books. I was a very um, this particular kind of Finn. But four years ago, I started studying something called the Three Seas Initiative, and then I traveled to Tallinn quite a lot to try to find out more about this. So perhaps my perspective in some ways is particularly Euro-Atlantic. And rather than to talk about it first, or to comment on your presentations, I prepared a couple of maps. I think if we have... Next slide, please. I don't have a... Perhaps we cannot move forwards. And the next slide. <laughs> I propose you continue. Yeah, now. Um, so, here is something I drew this spring. Um, if we want to know about my academic perspective on this subject, um, this is a pictorial representation I drew for my new research plan. Um, I am convinced that we should study now um, and in the future, in the next uh, several years, um, certain key areas related to European security. 
and I picked the seas Baltic Sea, Arctic Sea, and the Sea of Japan. And if we have the next slide. We can also see a little bit more how this is focused on European security. And we can have the next slide. So this is also what an academic perspective on today's topic looks like. Maunus, I have been learning NATO, my students have perhaps been learning NATO, because this is a primary source from a NATO research group on the Russian uh, fleet in the Mediterranean that originates from the Black Sea. Um, so this, I believe, also has something to do um, with today's topic. Next slide, please. So, from my perspective, from an academic perspective, commenting on these representations today, a few uh, points emerge. First of all, Finland's reference group is the Western world, and the political balance of power between the West and Russia has changed after 1991 to the advantage of the first. First in East European countries joining NATO, and now with the second enlargement process of Finland and Sweden. Russia has announced that it is fighting in Ukraine for its existence. What does it mean? Um, it means also that Russia is relatively weak in comparison to the Western alliance, notwithstanding nuclear weapons, but in these circumstances, from my academic perspective, it's relatively important to understand that the struggle for hegemony and the growing military engagement uh, is, represents also a risk of the insta instability increasing or widening. And I think Sven uh, began his remarks also on that. So uh, when we think about the maps that I represented, I am interested in this Arctic Ocean, the Baltic Sea, in the Sea of Japan. We should study them to also understand that the risk of the conflict widening outside of Ukraine is real, and we should work on that. Um, a goal for the future development of Finland's neighboring regions, I think, has to engage also um, um, an effort to maintain stability in the Baltic Sea and in the Arctic re region. From a strategic point of view, I think this is something that we have to think about. Um, and that we have to have also steps towards um, escalation, to try to work towards uh, a non-escalation towards instability. And here I come maybe to the point of our panel today. I believe that the stabilization in uh, our regions, these seas, um, is led by an engagement between the United States, Russia and China. And our Baltic seas are also theaters for these great powers. I also think that Finland's um, membership in NATO can and should be seen from these perspectives. That's part of the point of the academic world and my point of view towards um, today's um, contacts. Um, we could have a couple of more slides, what the academic view looks like. It looks like this. This is from another NATO working group in history. It represents all the um, uh, anchorages of the Russian Navy, uh, which are quite numerous. They are 19. NATO has 23. But nonetheless, I have been interested, and I am interested in, from the academic perspective in the future in learning about these anchorages. Why? Because in recent years, let's say um, in the last five or six years, many of the former Russian or Soviet positions around the world have been taken over by the Chinese Navy. We can see the next map. These were more um, Russian or Soviet um, military installations around the world. Several of these have been now occupied um, also by the Chinese uh, Navy. For example, one here is Madagascar. The base is at the end of the island on top. And if we see the next uh, map, we can also see it. Next slide, please. Here. Um, in recent studies that are non-academic, that are by um, NGO groups, here, for example, Madagascar is only marked as having an Indian base, 
but it has a vo former Russian Soviet uh, base that is uh, today owned by China. And um, from my perspective of a global historian working from Finland, um, I am concerned and I hope that in the future we can focus more widely on European security, but from this quite um, global perspectives, or let's say the perspectives of these possible future conflict areas. Um, so in that way, I believe that my thinking is quite um, along the lines of the former three speakers, but maybe a little bit more global in the perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, join, you. join the gentleman on the sofa. <laughs> Indeed. Now, we have um, a bit more than 15 minutes for discussion, and it is uh, quite an ambitious project given how uh, representative and many you are. But I'll try with you, uh, Ambassador, nevertheless, uh, first. Uh, uh, and if I can call you in this uh, conversation, Doug. Um, many times it has been said during this conference, for example, when we talk about Ukraine, as long as it takes. That is the requirement. And it's a statement. And then we've heard many say also that it may take a long while without anybody daring to put an end date to this yet. So, United States, as long as it takes, ahead of the presidential elections, yes or no? Are you referring to your presidential elections? Uh, not <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's sort of interesting. I was just back in the U.S. for a couple of weeks, and uh, I had a chance to visit with people in Congress. The resolve around um, support for Ukraine in Congress, particularly in the Senate, is very high. While there still are outliers that are fighting against it, uh, more in the House than in the Senate, but if you really look at it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a huge level of support for Ukraine. And if you see what's happening in Finland, it seems like every week we have a congressional delegation visiting from the United States and Finland. And we take it upon ourselves, the staff that we have at the embassy, quite frankly, as an opportunity to educate legislators on what's happening. Because you don't get a sense of it until you get closer to it. And uh, I, I will say, we just had the Secretary of Navy here in the last week. Um, the military is 100% supportive at virtually every level. Most of the legislators are supportive. Some of the presidential candidates that have come out and said that they would do something else. Um, I always say there's a difference between when you run for office and when you govern. Mm. And when you govern, you have to make tough decisions about what the reality of the world is. I don't think anybody is in a position in our politics to say they would want to pull out the support for Ukraine because they understand the risks. And as I said earlier, the Ukrainians are not just fighting for their own democracy, they're fighting for all of our democracies. And you know, Sven mentioned that maybe we should have done some things earlier and quicker I don't necessarily d disagree with that. And I think, uh, unfortunately, we've had to learn some things through this process. So just like Putin made a number of mistakes calculating the Ukrainians, maybe we made some mistakes. And I think we were re-looking re at all those things. So as an example, I'm sure it's going to come up on F-16s is the community, and I'll talk about it as a community, has decided that they're going to support Ukraine with that. We're going to support from training, and we have to sign off on U.S. product being, sold, being brought into Ukraine, which we said we're going to do. So I think uh, everybody understands what needs to be done. The challenge that we all have is we have to be really honest about this. The Russians are brutal. You know, I don't have to tell this to, to Finns. Mm -hmm. You've lived it, you've seen it and they'll use any resource they can to win. Mm. The only way we can deal with them and with Putin in general is a sign of strength. That's the only way we'll be able to deal with them. Mm. 
But I will tell you, my confidence level in talking to senators and congresspeople and to President Biden, and he made it really clear when he was here, uh, he's all in, his administration is all in, and I think if we continue to do a good job with the American people, the American people are in, but we need to continue to educate them on the process. Now, as a former EU official, I have to say that the cooperation between the United States and the European Union has never been closer or more efficient uh, than working out the sanctions policy, for example. But when you look at the next steps, and here I'm inviting everybody else in, uh, putting more pressure on Vladimir Putin, putting more pressure on the Russian state, uh, what are those next steps? What can be contemplated? What could make Western pressure even more effective than it is today? Who would like to start? Any thoughts on that? I can, I can do it. Thanks, Sue. Um, um, I mean, first observation is that we have had how many um, packages of sanctions? I don't know, 14. I, from EU, I have uh, lost count. And um, um, this is not because month after month we discover new areas of trade or things like that. It's actually that we have not been able we had a long list before. We have not been able to uh, agree on many issues before. So we move in the speed of basically kind of finding a consensus. And sometimes this is, this is slow. The, um, uh, in terms of the sanctions, I'm afraid probably we have uh, a, a on paper mostly ticked all the boxes. Uh, what we need to tick, tick now, meticulously, box after box, is closing all the loopholes, looking at the ways of where the transit of goods is actually reaching uh, Russia. I know Doug is probably not agreeing with me, but I mean, for me, the most uh, popular, the, my favorite US president of all times is Ronald Reagan. And what he did, uh, and was said to be most effective was the long-term effect of the sanctions on the all high-tech equipment to the Soviet Union. And that basically broke the kind of the military or some machinery of the Soviet Union in the long run. Uh, so I think this uh, has, to be, uh, has to be done. Uh, I did uh, speak previously about the need to uh, revamp very uh, quickly the um, uh, arms supplies and weapon supplies uh, to uh, Ukraine. Uh, I'm totally in agreement with the speakers at the previous panel, but that also means that we need to uh, make sure that European and North American arms industries are working at full speed. They are not, at least not more. Why they are not? Because they are not sure that they their investment will be needed in six or seven or eight, eight, eight years from now. We need to give them basically you know, that kind of a assurance uh, from the, the government's side that actually we are in the long run actually having a higher defense spending because Russia is not going away. This is a long-term menace. Uh, and when you look at my country, uh, then... Um, we had a first big war with Moscovia in 1558, when even the terrible armies were attacking the, uh, the, the then old Livonia, nowadays Estonia and Latvia. Uh, I would call on anybody uh, listening, uh, just open the Wikipedia page in English and type in Liv Livonian War. And when you scroll down the first illustration, which is contemporary from that time, from the 16th century, uh, is uh, depicting basically Russian war crimes. Women being hanged and their babies, with a, which have been cut into pieces, are in front of their, their feet. This is a, basically a uh, contemporary artist description of a Russian method of warfare in the Great Livonian War in the 16th century. Mm. We have not basically seen much difference right now in the 21st century, unfortunately. It's a long-term struggle. Uh, I am not optimistic at all that uh, we will have a new and nice and shiny Russia anytime soon. 
this is quite uh, unrealistic. We would rather have chicken chain and kind of keep a check on that, and that basically means a long-term investment in defense. This is we are not really doing too much nowadays. Okay. Rin. Um, to answer your question rather briefly, um, to begin thinking about coercion is probably a good idea to think about Moscow's perspective. Moscow um, has for a long time respected countries, like Sven said, uh, who responded forcefully, right? But great powers, big powers. So the engagement probably has to be led by United States and probably has to take in consideration China as well. However, I would be also thinking about and optimistic about using many different avenues to um, increase pressure, right? If we look at last week, uh, Turkey is one of the countries that did not join the BRICS uh, coalition. Why not? Because it's a member of NATO. Um, the United States has many such um, allies and tools to uh, pursue contact, maybe not dialogue, but also coercive contact. And um, I would look for those kinds of pressure points also, mm. many different ones at the same time. However, I think that Russia and China have to, be, for Russia, China and the United States have to be involved. Klaus. Yeah, I would say th three things. Uh, the first is, is to emphasize that it's first and foremost for Ukraine to decide on, on the fate of their own, Ukrainians to de decide on the fate of their own country, not for, not for uh, anybody else. So uh, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. The second is that we sh should just keep doing what we do. Uh, we should not send the signal to Putin that he can wait us out. That uh, when we say that uh, whatever it takes and how long as it takes, so, so uh, we, 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 we mean it. Um, yeah. then, then I had a, a, a th th third point. Uh, but maybe it comes later. Thank you. Yes. We have uh, still time for maybe a second round, and uh, this is a bit of a leap into the future, but I think it's um, as diplomats and uh, researchers, uh, you are well able to do that. I mean, no matter how long it takes, eventually there comes after. Mm -hmm. The war will end. And uh, the work of diplomacy and the work of uh, government is also to think about the years ahead. It has been said quite vocally here also that uh, Russia will not be welcomed into the Western uh, arms very soon or very gladly after everything that it has done in Ukraine. Uh, but what about Ukraine and the reconstruction of Ukraine? And in the spirit of reconstruction of Ukraine, which is an effort in it to itself, its membership in Western communities, NATO, EU, can one happen and the other not? Or are they processes that have to be looked at together. And maybe I can pick up because that's yes, my that's your third that, that was my <laughs> first, th third point. Um, I think the, the, the third important thing is also to take care about our own unity, the unity of the European Union, unity of NATO, but also to increase cooperation between the European Union and NATO. And I think there is a reason for cautious optimism on this, uh, because uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine has had a unifying uh, effect on uh, the community of democratic states and, and also it has uh, promoted uh, the cooperation between EU uh, and, and, and NATO. Karina, what's your view on this? <laughs> My view is that uh, one can come before the other as long as the other one comes. I suppose that's a Finnish perspective. Um, I would say also that in Brussels what we have now and what we should pursue are perhaps uh, some new thoughts on enlargement, right? The, I don't uh, think very too critically about the French initiative of uh, several different timelines or um, different frameworks, as long as it takes the enlargement process confidently forwards. I think we can look for new frameworks, timelines, avenues, as long as there is movement forwards. And Doc, what's the Atlantic take on this? Yeah, I guess, you know, when I look at it, I think the, the best weapon we can have against Putin is unity. Mm -hmm. So that's unity in the EU, it's unity in NATO, uh, it's the coalition of, of the willing. You know, when you think about 
what Putin has done, I mean, he miscalculated the whole process. He really thought the Ukrainians would fall. He thought the U.S. would not be particularly supportive. He thought the EU would not be supportive. He thought NATO would not be. Um, all of that uh, went wrong for him. And, but the advantage he does have, if you're an oligarch, you can move your GDP anywhere you want and spend it anywhere you want. So he has, he has that advantage. But that will run out of time. That will run its course. And you've seen just recently the devaluation of, of the ruble. You've seen inflation characteristics. You've seen now they're putting more taxes on energy industry because it's the only industry they have in Russia. Uh, those things will run out of time and people will run out of patience. Now, the, the, the question is, when does that intersect? You know, I don't know. But the best weapon we have against Putin is unity. If we don't have that, then we run the risk of failure. That's right. Uh, three points. Um, um, first point is that uh, NATO and EU enlargement have been the best tools the West has had in the last 30 years in increasing stability and strengthening the whole of, of Europe. Uh, my country has been uh, one beneficiary of that among others and I can testify uh, to, uh, to that, uh, and we still have this tool. Um, second observation uh, is about uh, NATO enlargement to, uh, to include Ukraine. Now, and this is uh, connected to the first part of the question, which is about reconstruction, what comes later. Now, uh, we cannot reconstruct Ukraine just on a public purse. We need to have a private investment, massively. Now, can anyone imagine that a private investment wants to invest in Ukraine if Russia can start a war again? And, you know, uh, uh, do we believe if Putin says, no, I'm not going to do it again? Of course, we cannot trust him. The only way to make it sure it will not happen is uh, to, for Ukraine to win the war and to be admitted as quickly as possible to NATO, because that is the best way of actually guaranteeing that reconstruction will happen, and not on uh, basically the state budget of our countries, but on a private uh, investment. And then the, the, the last thing is coming back to, in a way, the, to what we need to show strength, resolve, solidarity, steadfastness, is that you know, they, why did Putin miscalculate Western resolve and Western unity? He had very good reasons to miscalculate. Uh, uh, he uh, basically carved out frozen conflicts from Georgia and uh, Moldova in the early 90s. Not him, Russian. Russia did. But what did the West do? Nothing. Uh, he uh, attacked Georgia occupied, is still occupying one-fifth of Georgian territory. What did the West do? Nothing. 2014, Crimea, Donbass, what did the West do? Practically nothing. I mean, there is a part of our country's territory was declared yourself and occupied by, by, uh, by, uh, by Russian forces. Of course, the calculation is that I can get away. A couple of months of bad diplomacy, maybe some sanctions, but I will get through it. Nord Stream 1 was built, Nord Stream 2 was built. After Georgia, first one, after Crimea, the second one. Of course, there was an ample reason for Putin to miscalculate. And basically, we should make sure that he does not miscalculate any further. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to Thank clarify, you. I just yes. want to clarify one thing. Um, uh, I did vote for Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all of you. And thank you, Rayo. Let's give a good hand for our panelists. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, while, you are, uh, while you are taking your seats, I will uh, make a short summary uh, what Doug said about uh, unity. Was, uh, was a key message to us all. And I think that uh, Sven was in his uh, element where he is known about when, when he was interpreting uh, history and what we learned about 2010 after, after 2010 events. 
Now we are uh, facing uh, the final session, which has been uh, actually the very key issue of this uh, European situation uh, and what kind of peace in Ukraine and what is the future of Europe and Ukraine. Uh, I want to pay attention uh, that, uh, in my opinion, uh, the problem with Mr. Putin is that, that uh, he comes from an era where the uh, Russian history and especially the Soviet history was written about three times, three versions, what happened. Uh, and uh, actually what he has stated during the last, uh, last three years about Europe, about Ukraine and about uh, Russian relations with Ukraine uh, has varied very much. And we are uh, also having a battlefield in historical uh, narratives. And this is very important because what is the narrative of Ukraine? This is very important for the whole Europe. And this is also a part of the Finnish history when you visit Ukraine. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, this is extremely exciting. But now we are uh, getting uh, to the very deep uh, question about the peace, what we are really looking for. And in Finland, uh, the ambassador, the Ukrainian ambassador, uh, Mrs. Uh, Olga Dibrova, has given the face for Ukrainian people, what we can see from the television. But we can also see them as refugees and as our uh, co-workers here in Finland. For instance, in my island, in my, my, my second apartment, uh, we have a number of good uh, Ukrainian uh, agrarian workers who are very, very good people uh, during the whole, whole summer period of time. But what about the peace? What about the future? How long this will take and what is the plan of Mr. Zelensky? Mrs. Diprova, welcome. Dear friends, it's a big honor to address such an esteemed audience. And uh, I would like first to thank the organizers of the forum for keeping Ukraine high on the agenda, as well as the organizers of this panel, Anders Reyo. Thank you very much for uh, letting me speak about peace, because uh, that is what Ukrainians uh, are about. We were forced to be on the battlefield uh, to defend uh, our existence but Ukrainians are people of peace. And it's a really great feeling uh, to be surrounded by true friends and partners. And I would like to underline amazing solidarity of your nations uh, with my fellow citizens. And it gives us a valuable and power powerful incentive to fight for our own future and for the future of Europe and to reach just and lasting peace. Uh, I can surely say, as a Ukrainian, that Ukraine will win this existential battle against terrorist state Russia. Ukrainians will liberate all Ukrainian territories, including Crimea. We will effectively defend Europe and democratic values. And eventually, we will restore the rule of law on the international level. For reaching these goals at this moment, we need more weapons and munitions. The destiny of the European security will be decided, unfortunately, on the battlefield. We need F-16s as soon as possible, long-range rockets, 
and all other defense equipment and materials to restore control on all parts of Ukraine promptly, saving thousands of lives of Ukrainians on the battlefield and civilians in the cities and towns in all parts of Ukraine, which are under constant threat of missile attack. I thank Finland for 18 packages of defense assistance, and I also praise a powerful international coalition supporting Ukrainian defensive efforts. We rely on continuation of Dynaminsk support uh, to our country. We also need to increase joint arms production and Ukrainians are now concentrated on strengthening our own defense capabilities. For this aim, we convene already this fall Defense Industries Forum in Ukraine. The date will be announced shortly, and we expect active participation of defense industries of our friends and allies in this forum. Full liberation of all territories of Ukraine is the most important, but not sufficient condition for a just and lasting peace in Europe. There are three other critical prerequisites for peace. First and foremost, we need to bring to justice all responsible for crime of aggression, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes committed by Russia in Ukraine. Strong and effective sanctions and full political and economic isolation of Russia should be also considered as a part of accountability track. Second prerequisite of a just and lasting peace. Russia should pay for recovery and long-term reconstruction of Ukraine. It means that all available and accessible Russia's assets uh, should be frozen, confiscated, and legal instruments created on the national and international levels for bringing these assets for development of Ukraine. In May, within the Council of Europe, we have taken a very important step by creating the register of damage caused by Russia's aggression against Ukraine. The third, and maybe most strategically important prerequisite of a just and lasting peace, is Ukraine's accelerated accession to NATO. This war has started in 2014 by Russia due to the only reason to deprive Ukrainians of their fundamental right to choose own destiny, to be a full-fledged member of the Euro-Atlantic community of common security space. Later, Russia openly stated its opposition to Ukraine's membership in the EU. And we, we, have, we hope to start uh, accession negotiations to the European Union already by the end of this year, and we rely on your support. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we all need a lasting peace and stable rules-based international order. Ukraine deserves a just peace, just as all nations in Europe and in the world. To reach this goal, we need to deal with distorted and unpredictable reality, which has been unfolding last and this year because of political blindness and wishful thinking of previous decades. Nobody in Kremlin has never hid their imperialistic ambitions. From the beginning, we need to remember that Russia's blatant barbaric attack on Ukraine is not just a violation of all possible international norms, but it's also a very long-term attack on our style of life, its attack on progress, its attack on economic development, on social order of all countries in the world. As Mayor Arva, you rightly said several times during this forum, and as Minister Valtanen said in her today's speech, as well as my colleague ambassadors, the fight of Ukrainians is for values. Over decades, Russia has weaponized energy supply, information flow, mass media, 
international sport, food supply, and even migration. Russia has been doing it for decades, using the hunger of some elites to simple solutions. All Europeans this winter has faced high spike of prices for electricity and heating. Every day we, buy, we pay higher and higher prices in the grocery stores, and this line could be continued. Only now we recognize the dependency on one source of energy resources, as well as any critical materials or technologies, is a grave threat. Only now we recognized that comprehensive investments in green transition and hydrogen economy is even more a matter of the national and international security than the instrument to deal with climate changes. We definitely need complex vision of the reality and comprehensive toolkit to create a new one, more stable on the long term. Reality where the rule of law is secured, international community is strong and resilient, International institutions are true guardians of the order and international norms. All our societies are resilient and capable not to tackle but avoid systemic challenges in the legal, energy, food, nuclear, ecological sectors. Such a complex approach was a key rationale of the peace formula that President of Ukraine Volodymyr Zelensky presented in November 2022 during the G20 summit in Indonesia. It aims to solve two key tasks, to ensure a comprehensive, just and sustainable peace in Ukraine and to guarantee security for the world. The peace formula consists of 10 fundamental points, radiation and nuclear safety, food safety, energy security, release of prisoners and deported persons, implementation of the UN Charter and restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity and the world order, withdrawal of Russian troops and cessation of hostilities, restoration of justice, ecological safety, preventing escalation of war and repetition of aggression, confirmation of the, war, of the end of the war. Ukraine is actively working to engage the widest possible range of states in the implementation of the peace formula. While it's critically important to find all essential solutions to such a complex phenomena as Russia's aggression on the international order. Ukraine proposes that each of 10 points be coordinated by one or more leading countries, other countries can actively participate in the implementation of one or more po points as participants. Joining other points of the Ukrainian peace formula does not oblige you to join all the points as a whole. Currently, more than 50 countries from Europe, North America, Latin America, Africa and Asia have joined the regular discussions on points of the Ukrainian peace plan that should be taken as the basis for restoration of a comprehensive, just and sustainable peace in Ukraine because the war is being fought on the Ukrainian territory. The Ukrainian side seeks, seeks to attract the maximum number of opinions from partners. At the same time, the main approach to interaction within the process remains unchanged. Proposals from partners must be based on the UN Charter and respect for its principles. We are ready to consider all initiatives that are based on respecting the territorial integrity of Ukraine and do not lead to freezing the conflict. President Zelensky's strategy for implementing the peace formula has three phases. The first phase includes meetings with ambassadors accredited in Ukraine for a detailed discussion of each point of peace formula. The second phase consists of meetings of the national security and political advisors uh, uh, of the ministries of foreign affairs and representatives of the ministries of foreign affairs in order to find optimal formulations and mechanisms for the implementation of the peace plan. The first such meeting took place in Denmark in June, and the, um, and the next one took place recently in Saudi Arabia in Jeddah. 
The third stage should be the holding of the Global Peace Summit at the level of the heads of states by the end of 2023. I would like to use this opportunity to call upon you to be active promoters of peace formula as a universal vision on how to build lasting peace and be active leaders or participants of implementation of the formula. This will be a real contribution not only to ending the war, the scale of which has not been known in Europe since World War II, but also an investment in the security of your own countries. Future of Europe depends on our ability to make prompt and brave decisions and on our readiness to substantial transformation. To conclude, I would say that keywords for Ukrainians now are unity. Unity with our friends and partners who help us to win the war. And speed, so that necessary weapons are supplied to Ukraine as quick as possible. And thank you for mentioning this in this room already before. We have to be creators of the future, and this future will start with the victory of Ukraine and our common one. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador Diprova. Before I give the floor uh, to the last speaker, uh, I, I have to make a question about Russia. Uh, how do you see, uh, from, from uh, your point, from your Ukrainian point of view, that how the ordinary Russians are living with this uh, heavy barrier of the war, from their point of view? Can you describe something to us about their role? Because. Uh, we think that, that uh, without, if they don't understand what they are doing, we are, very, uh, we are in great troubles with the peace. Um, of course, it's difficult to, think, uh, to speak on behalf of Russians, but um, I think that ordinary Russian now should live with a feeling of guilt, shame, blood on their hands, and mortal sins on their souls. And of course, Ukraine uh, hoped during the first months uh, um, since the full-scale invasion happened uh, in February 2022, that ordinary Russians, the Russian people, will stand up, that there will be massive uprisings um, you know, uh, against against uh, this brutality, the war, hostilities, and all the horror that uh, we have uh, lived through during that month and which continues now. Uh, I think the whole Ukraine was literally calling Russia, especially uh, uh, the people of Kharkiv, who were immediately bombed, you know, the twin city of Turku. They were in the bomb shelters calling the other side. I know this from them personally. Uh, telling their relatives, stop it, what are you doing? We are in the bomb shelters, we cannot get out for weeks. Unfortunately, Ukrainians have not been heard. Um, Ukrainian president and the Ukrainian minister of defense were probably the most patient ones of all Ukrainians trying to call Russians to join the good side of the story uh, and to call even Russian military to join the right side. But in majority, uh, we were not successful. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker will be Mr. Timo Pesonen. Uh, to introduce him would be a very long list 
but I can say that uh, since the whole membership of Finland in European Union, there is not a place where his hand wouldn't have been present. So he has been in very many Pesapal. questions. Pesapal too, that is something, it's Finnish baseball. Also but, your Yankees. Yes. But uh, Timo, uh, who is uh, now the uh, Director General of uh, uh, Space and, and Arms Defense Industry, will give us the response from European perspective from the European community. Thank you, Please. thank you, Anders, and it's a, an honor to be here, this Europa Forum. Last year I couldn't make it, but normally I've been here every year, and I, I, I really salute uh, Mayor Minna for your support. This would never happen without the strong commitment of, uh, of Turku uh, uh, City. I think almost everything has been said. That's always the pleasure of being the last speaker in this, uh, uh, this afternoon. I think well, I was listening to you, all of you, and uh, I was thinking, we all remember September 11. I'm sure that each of us, at least a bit with the elder generation, we remember the moment where we were, where you were when you recognized what the cowardless Al-Qaeda terrorists did on September 11 against the United States of America, against the West. In the same way, I will never forget February 24th. And I'm sure we all will remember that. Waking up early in the morning with the news that the Russian tanks have has crossed the border, uh, uh, para paramilitary troops are in Kiev, looking for Zelensky and the Ukrainian government, trying to take over Kiev and occupy the, well, the sovereign, independent European country. That was devastating. Of course, there were signs that it is about to happen, but of course also hopes that he would not be that crazy, that he would do it. But he did it. And that was the end of the naivety. September 11 was the end of a naivety against the, the terrorists. The fight against terrorism started that day, and the whole West was united. And the global uh, geopolitical scenario changed and it, it is for, for good. And the same what Putin did. Putin made three main mistakes. Already Ambassador Hickey referred to that. First of all, he totally overestimated his own military might. As a dictator, he believed that he has the best weapons. You know, when the dictator goes to the, the military you know, exercise, he's shown how the missile, the Russian missile, is the best in the world, the most precise, the fastest, and the strongest. How their tanks will war, march to Kiev in a few days. How their military troops will, will eliminate Zelensky in hours. And that did not happen. Secondly, even more, he could not understand, being a dictator, being born and raised in Soviet Union, the will of the Ukrainian people to stand up and fight against the Russians. And Zelensky was offered the way out to save himself and his family, and he did not do it. He did not do it. Putin would have immediately escaped. I'm not sure whether he flew to St. Petersburg when the drunk Wagner soldiers were marching to Moscow, a few thousand of them. Was that true or not? But maybe yes. So you understand that this, this is the dynamics between the free, the free democratic countries and the dictatorship. And the thirdly, miscalculated and underestimated the unity of the West. As Ambassador said, he was reading reports. UK, he knew UK left EU, EU is weaker. France and Germany can never agree. There are other member states who will block, you know, tough sanctions, etc., etc. And US will not be in full strength supporting Ukraine and total miscalculation. We have been united from the day one, and we will stay united. I think all the messages this afternoon, or also from the Minister of Altonen, underlines that there is not a single sign of disunity in the West, in the EU and in the NATO and in the, in the, in the, in the broader alliance. But of course, the war also showed how badly prepared 
Europe was in, in, the, in, the, in, in the face of a conventional war in Europe. Ambassador Korhonen remembers when uh, in 1990s Finland was, uh, was uh, uh, reforming our artillery. There were colleagues in Europe laughing, laughing at us. Why on earth you still buy new artillery? I mean, those days are over. The modern war is about cyber, hybrid, you know. There will not be a conventional war. Why do you still have 350,000 men ready to be mobilized? Well, now we know why. So Finland and Poland never gave up the concept of territorial defense and, and the mobilization of, of a huge number of, of troops, if needed. But also our, our defense expenditure has been very low in Europe. And the American presidents, one, each, one after each other, has said until, from the day one, end of the Cold War, Europe, you need to invest more on defense. And that's what we are doing now. That's what we are doing now, finally. Euro area crisis, the financial crisis in, in 2010, 2011, the defense expenditure went down drastically. And it is only now steadily growing and coming to the level of 2% of the GDP minimum what is the NATO uh, 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 commitment of the Allies. So we have to invest more on defense, and we have to invest better. We are giving the member states everything what we have, and as soon as we can, to Ukraine. But is it enough? No. We have to do more and faster, as Ambassador Sakov said. We have to be faster in our delivery of the armaments, ammunition, Shells, missiles, fighters, of course, also. The training is very important. Uh, I came from Toledo, informal defense minister's meeting, and there uh, uh, the high representative Juan Borrell, he said that we should have 40,000 Ukrainian soldiers trained in Europe instead of the 30,000, which is the current uh, commitment. So we have to do more and more. And there I know that the Finland is also uh, doing its fair share. Finland has also given a lot to Ukraine. Uh, for strategic reasons, Finland does not uh, tell the public uh, what kind of support we are, we are doing because we have our own border to be watched. Uh, but of course, I mean, no, nobody exceeds the Estonian uh, 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 efforts and also Poland and, and Czechia are doing, doing a lot, uh, being of course close to, the, close to Ukraine. So what we are doing in Europe, we have, a, I would say, a, a triple challenge. First of all, the urgent support to, to Ukraine with weapons, ammunition, training, material. And that has, to be done, that has to be done as fast as possible. And second, we have to ramp up our own industrial production. On the one hand, to be able to support Ukraine, but also to ramp up our own shells. We have to be better prepared in the future. It can't be so that we are only doing the minimum in order to be able to Ukraine, and we leave our own uh, uh, military preparedness at the same level it was before the war. That cannot happen. We can't afford to that. And the third, we have to invest on research and development, on innovation. We have to be in the front of the, of the defense uh, industrial uh, development. The United States is our most important partner. We would be nowhere in helping Ukraine without American commitment. And we would be very, we would be very cold in Europe without the US presence in Europe. But we have to be also ready to strengthen our own strategic autonomy, to strengthen our own capabilities for all the reasons, uh, also for the future. So I would sum up, we do as much as we can. In the European Commission, we are preparing, of course, the sanction packages, and the sanctions are working. They are working. It is never 100% waterproof. You know, there are always uh, little loopholes here and there. But in, in the big picture, it has a significant importance for Russia and for the Russian economy. And also, I'm, I'm sure, for the, we don't know what the Russians are thinking. We, cannot, we can guess, but there is a nervousness. There is a nervousness in Russia because the sanctions and this isolation of Russia, it has implications and it must have implications. What comes to the peace, I fully, uh, Ambassador, uh, is for Ukrainian people, Ukrainian leaders, uh, to uh, hopefully come at some moment 
to, to peace, but it cannot be dictated by anybody outside. It is for you and your leaders and your people to, to work for it. And of course, a Russian to stop, withdraw, and face the, face the defeat. Thank you very much. Timo, Mr. Pesonen, thank you very much for your kind words. And I use the opportunity to thank you also the support and cooperation what we have done with you during the uh, process of Europe Forum during the years. Mrs. Diprova, it was a pleasure to get you here and listen to your uh, fabulous speech about the uh, Ukrainian future, what we are fully supporting. Thank you very much. And now we are giving the closing words to my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Kempinen, who is also uh, the chair of the Europe Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Europe Forum on uh, uh, Advisory Board. Reo, please. Thank you. Where was I on September 11, 2001? Actually, I was in. Ukraine, the EU-Ukraine summit in the Magnificent Palace in Yalta, who has now momentarily has been lost to aggressive forces. That's why I remember that day, like others remember some other dates so well. Now, as the chair of the advisory board, it gives me a great pleasure to thank you, everybody, for being here are being a very well-behaving, disciplined, uh, positive, constructive audience. Um, we have had, also on this year, um, outstanding success. We have 800 people here in Turku attending these talks, 170 speakers, and 2,500 unique online followers. So the numbers are growing. It's a magnificent effort. It's the sixth time that has been organized. And like Arendt said at the beginning, all this came up from a very simple idea. An ambassador to Sweden was approached by his colleague uh, and asked, have you heard about this Europa Forum in Sweden? Why can't we do anything like that? And when this ambassador then saw some colleagues from Turku, where he was giving a talk, he approached this idea, and he then later told me that, was it two months later, somebody called Anders Blum pulled his sleeve and said, we're going to do it. This was 2017. Out of nowhere came a good idea. Out of nowhere, people in Turku the city of Turku, the academic community in Turku, lots of other people came together only as people in this part of the country can do and organized the first Europe Forum. Now, 2023, a success again. It has become a milestone also in the sense that this is now truly recognized as the political opening of the Finnish political uh, autumn a unique of its kind and the biggest of its kind of events in Finland. And you are the audience to thank for that. I would also like to address big thanks on behalf of the forum and its organizers to the organizers themselves. I'm here just uh, doing talks, uh, uh, but also to Mayer, uh, whose commitment and support has been not only outstanding, but also irreplaceable. Uh, for the success of the event of this kind. And it's not going to end here. There will be the seventh, there will be the eighth, and so forth. But this autumn is also for us a bit of a moment of reflection. We have grown, this event has grown. It is now recognized. And when I'm looking at the back, these two, three days, some things have to be highlighted the speech this morning of uh, Prime Minister Orbo. Um, I've written a few speeches of my own to other people, but rarely have I heard something that was so clearly articulating the policy and the aspirations of a government in terms of its mandate for the next years for the European Union. 
there was no ifs, there was no buts. That's a declaration of intent that has to be taken for its worth and has to be taken seriously. And we will do that. Earlier, there was a suggestion by Finnish Commissioner Jutta Urpilainen uh, that maybe a political seminar about the Finnish Europe policy should be organized annually, and maybe here. And if I'm not misunderstanding, Petteri Orpo is not adverse to that idea at all. So let's see where this comes and where this develops from there. Your feedback is always welcome, and maybe more than ever now, when we have this reflection hat on in terms of where can Europe Forum grow uh, when it approaches the next years uh, of its life. Some other highlights, I have to admit, also struck uh, very much so. Esko Antola Luento, given by, uh, talk given by Erki Liikanen, reminded us of the long history and the pragmatic character of Finnish foreign policy. Uh, pragmatic to the sense that uh, discussions on values have maybe been not so familiar to us as it has been to some other countries and in some other countries. But the events that we are witnessing and being drawn into bring that discussion of values all the more importantly also to the Finnish politics and very good that it does that too. Everybody, I hope, has had uh, their own takings of this. As I said, uh, we would very much appreciate feedback. But uh, without further ado, this is not the end. If I'm not mistaken, there are cocktails after this, soiree. And, uh, and uh, um, I hope that you will join us and um, celebrate further the closure of the event uh, under uh, rainless skies. Thank you very much.